presenting on activity and intent recognition. So by now, all of us are well-versed in the Martian scenario. We have Mark Watney, who is alone on Mars, needing to accomplish all tasks by himself, uh, except that he has some hopefully very helpful autonomous rovers or some level of autonomy uh, robots that are there with him. So this begs the question, what are the qualities we really want to see in a collaborative robot teammate? And we've, gone, we've seen a little bit uh, of a taste of this as we've gone through lectures in the last two weeks, but today we're really going to focus in on these three. Uh, first, we want for the robot to be able to understand what it is that the human is doing. So I want to know that Mark is walking. He's going from point A to point B. Recognize that he's walking. But I also want to understand what his goal is. I want to know that he is walking to go pick up this heavy object, but his destination is with the intent of them picking up an object. Uh, and that would enable kind of goal number three, is that then the robot would be able to assist Mark, hopefully, in driving over and maybe being in close proximity so he can help lift the object or help transport the object. Uh, so we want to be able to recognize what the human is doing, uh, anticipate what their higher level goal is, and then eventually help them out as well. So the question is, how do we achieve these qualities? And that brings us to today's topic of activity recognition and intent recognition. So these are two fields that are, are strongly related. Activity recognition is more concerned with uh, lower level actions, uh, so looking at noisy sensor data and figuring out what is the, the low level action that's happening here, such as walking. Um, whereas intent recognition is a slightly higher level of abstraction of looking at what is the person's goal or what is uh, the end result of their plan. So you can think of this a little bit as a hierarchy where the bottom is going to be that lower level information that's more like in activity recognition. And as you move up the pyramid into those higher levels of abstraction, you get into intent recognition. So for the rest of this presentation, we'll use this arrow at the bottom to kind of help guide you. It's a little easier to see than the pyramid. Um, but this is kind of the same idea of starting at the lowest level data here on the left and moving from activity to intent recognition by going into higher levels of abstraction of the information that we're trying to interpret. So when we look at raw sensor data, this might be video data or depth data that we're looking at, that's essentially going to come to us in, in some kind of matrix form, and we'll look more into this later, but it's going to be noisy, high-dimensional data that we then want to extract features from. So in the example of a human skeleton, we might look at their joints, we might look at their skeletal frame and say, this is a pose we can extract, which is a feature of that noisy data set. But more than that, we're really trying to recognize what are the activities involved here. So we want to be able to see a sequence of poses and say, this is the activity of a person hammering. I want to actually identify what it is that they're doing in this moment. Uh, but then, ideally, that, that really isn't enough. We want to know why it is that they're hammering. And for example, they might be building a chair, or building some piece of furniture. So that's the idea of intent recognition, uh, is, is what is it that this action is leading to, or the sequence of actions is really aiming to do. So what we'll go over is kind of an overview of activity and intent recognition, uh, go into some specific state-of-the-art examples of each of these. And our goal for you is really that you'll have a broad overview of the field, kind of know what the, the normal techniques are in each of these areas and the kinds of techniques you might want to employ if you're ever doing any of these tasks. Um, but we're going to spend a lot of our time in these kind of specific examples of current approaches that will hopefully ground some of the, the principles we're talking about here. So starting with activity recognition. Uh, this is going to cover sort of these first three pieces of the arrow, going from the raw data to actually the activities, or identifying what that activity is. So like I mentioned, first we start off with the raw sensor data. Uh, and in a lot of environments, we'll use kind of motion capture systems that typically are multi-camera settings, like a Vicon or a face face or something along those lines. Um, and we'll use those to be able to either track active or passive markers that are on a human, to track UAVs as they're flying through space. Um, sometimes we don't have that equipment, and so we might resort to something like the Microsoft Connect, which uses just an RGBD, like RGB plus uh, depth data to gather this information. Um, and so we can kind of anticipate for something like the Martian, we'll probably not have multiple cameras staged around the surface of Mars, but we might be able to have a camera or something along those lines. All of this data that will eventually come into us just in a kind of noisy matrix format that we do want to extract some features from to make it a little bit uh, lower dimensional. So some of the things we want to think about when we're talking about extracting features, we want to reduce the complexity of the space, like I mentioned. Um, we'd also like for uh, the whatever it is that we're observing to be translation invariant. And this is something you'll see a lot when you're looking at you know, CNNs or something where I, I want to be able to recognize that <coughs> this person is doing a hammering job if they are in the left part of the screen or the right part of the screen. It doesn't really matter where in the field of view they are. I still want to be able to recognize the activity. And most of the time, that works pretty well, being able to just consider it translation invariant. We also want it to be size invariant, especially when we're talking about humans. Um, I want to be able to recognize that somebody of a smaller stature 
uh, someone who is 5'2", is doing a hammering task equally as well as somebody who is 6'3". Uh, so we, we want to be able to consider all of these things. So on the, on the right, this is just a picture of kind of the joints of the skeleton, which is, might be our starting point. But we, we will start by kind of clustering those joints into poses. And so most often, uh, you'll just see this, this picture of a skeleton, and that's reducing the dimensionality of our data to make it easier to work with. For translation and variance, when we're dealing with humans, we're just going to fix the reference frame at their torso. It makes it the easiest that really at that point, no matter where they're at in the screen, um, all of the data that you're taking in is relative to the uh, position of the human and where they're at in that moment. And then size and variance, you're just going to take the, most, most often people will take the torso to neck distance and normalize all of the data with respect to that. So it's just an easy way to kind of uh, deal with data that can then be translated or uh, can be considered for different sized people or even different sized objects. So this brings us, now that we have some, some features from our data, we really want to get to this idea of activity recognition. We want to take in something like this. We're going to use this example a lot, the hammering scenario. Uh, and we want to identify that this is hammering. That's, that's kind of the goal of activity recognition. Um, and there are a number of ways to do this. Primarily, though, this is a pretty good classification problem. It seems like a pretty basic classification problem that you'd be able to somehow take in this data and identify what kind of activity it is. If I have maybe 10 possible activities it could be, can I classify which activity of those 10 this is? Uh, and so we learn it really through a classification pipeline. And so most of the time, activity recognition is a machine learning problem that uses either supervised learning or unsupervised learning approaches. Um, we're also not going to spend a ton of time going through these because I really do want to get to the more grounded implementation. But I'll go through a quick overview of how this works in activity recognition. So the question we're asking in the first formulation of supervised learning is what are the actions that are occurring in this time series of data? So this is really the goal. We want to see the sequence of poses pass into our pipeline and get out result that it's hammering. Uh, and so what we're going to do is just use this, this example of, for instance, pouring water. If we're seeing a, an image or a video of somebody pouring water, how is it that we can use, uh, how is it that we can get to the point of classifying this activity? And I think a lot of us are familiar with the idea of supervised learning, but if just as a brief refresh, you need a labeled data set. So you're passing in a bunch of examples of what it might look like to pour water, each of those with its ground truth label passing into the pipeline and trying to make sure that you can predict, uh, trying to minimize the, the error of predicting the correct label. If, if we only passed in this data, we would predict everything is pouring water. I would be able to throw an example of me waving my hand and you would say it's pouring water because it's the only example you've seen. So we do have to pass in uh, a bunch of other activities so that we do have this breadth uh, teaching our classifier to identify and distinguish between activities. But the idea here is that we're just minimizing the error between what the uh, supervised learning pipeline is predicting and what our ground truth label is. So obviously this needs a labeled data set in order to work. You need to know for each of these activities what is it a priori. Uh, but then the output of this would be we pass in our example that we're interested in and indeed we do get that it's pouring water. Uh, so there are a number of activity data sets out there because this has been uh, a, a field for quite a while now and as technology increases uh, we're I think getting better and better data on this. You can see though a lot of the data sets that exist are doing pretty mundane tasks. You'll see things like cooking, sitting down, uh, throwing a punch, uh, hammering is on here as well. Uh, so if your activity of interest falls within things like this, within these categories, then supervised learning will work pretty well. Um, and, and these data sets most often will then do these activities in different environments by different people. It's pretty robust. This is a really good option if you're just looking at classifying activities that fall within these categories. And so it's, it's a good method using supervised learning for activity recognition with the biggest drawback being what if it is that you're looking to classify an activity that doesn't exist in a data set, um, that doesn't exist in one of the, the labeled data sets that's out there, then it's pretty expensive to try to generate that data yourself and try to find a way to really classify other things of interest. Uh, and so that kind of brings us to unsupervised learning, where the, the biggest benefit is you don't need labeled data to do this. So the idea behind, generally, behind using unsupervised learning for activity recognition is that we're just trying to learn what features can distinguish different activities from each other, such that we can know different classes of activities exist. We might not, or the algorithm won't tell us what the name is for that activity. We won't know that it's pouring water, but we can at least distinguish between uh, pouring water versus throwing a basketball. It can learn features of that space that differentiate them from each other. 
So for example, in our earlier pictures that we had of pouring water, it might be able to identify that the commonality between all of the examples we're passing in is the stream that's being passed through. So it might be able to cluster the, uh, the cells in that and see you know, there's, a, there's a stream of water, and that is going to be our marker by which we can say these all belong to the same class of activity. So something along those lines. So it learns some of the features that are relevant to different activities. Uh, so this is great because we don't need labeled data. It's a lot cheaper in that respect. Um, it does require a lot of data to train this well, and it's a little bit less informative because we don't know what that lab what the activity actually is. We just know that it's distinguished from other activities. Um, and it also requires extensive training time. But both of these, looking at supervised and unsupervised <coughs> learning, uh, they work pretty well and have really high accuracy in general for activity recognition. Uh, and also are just beneficial because, uh, or that, yeah, in general, they're pretty high performing as long as uh, we really don't mind understanding what it is that the algorithms are finding or what they're doing. Because the issue that you often run across, with, or run across in machine learning algorithms is that it can get pretty high accuracy on what you're training. You might not know really why. You might not exactly know what it's learning, how it's learning it, where that accuracy is coming from. Uh, and that poses a problem for Mark because we know that these um, machine learning algorithms are also not infallible. They're going to make mistakes. They're not going to classify everything correctly. That can be catastrophic. It depends on what the activity is. It depends on the scenario. But what we really like to do is enable Mark to understand why it is that when something goes wrong, what is the cause of it? We want him to be able to diagnose those errors and say, it's classifying that I'm walking when actually I am I, trying to dig a hole. Why is that happening, and can he help in correcting the robot and figuring out what it is that he's actually doing? And these existing machine learning techniques don't cover that. They aren't going to enable him to understand uh, there isn't any transparency in how they're making their decisions, um, as we all know. So this is the idea behind the uh, algorithm we'll be looking into next, called Raptor. The rapid activity prediction through object-oriented regression with the full acronym, Raptor. So this will uh, be our activity recognition example. And the, the whole premise behind this, or its contribution to the activity recognition community, is the idea that can, we can do activity recognition in a way that's human interpretable and understandable. Uh, so we'll go through the kind of reason that this is the case, look at some of the training for activity recognition that Raptor uses, and then how we apply it. The basis behind making this interpretable is first by splitting up uh, your, the environment or what you're interested in into objects. Uh, so for example, for the human skeleton, we're going to split each of the individual joints into discrete objects and consider each of those independently of each other. So this is the idea that we uh, can really capture local patterns in the data by looking at these, these smaller segments uh, and seeing how they contribute to the overall activity recognition. So more concretely, we're saying how does a single object contribute to our ability to recognize an activity? For example, looking at just the right hand. We want to know when we're classifying, say, two activities, hammering and drawing an X. Uh, top, you can see this example we've been using, and then the bottom, it's somebody just drawing a big X in the air. Can we understand how the right hand, specifically, how this one object can help us distinguish between these two activities? So how we would go about this, uh, we'd start again, it's all centered at the human's reference frame, remember to make sure it's translation invariant, uh, and all we do is we, we take a human and we say, perform the action of hammering, and we're going to track their right hand as they perform this action. So on the right you can see their trajectory over time in their own reference frame of what that action might look like as we're tracing the right hand. We then ask maybe the same human to do the second task, which is drawing the X. And we'll do the same thing, we'll just plot the trajectory of their hand through space. Uh, so at the end of the day, we have the, the red trajectory is hammering, the blue trajectory is drawing an X. Uh, we won't really have continuous data, because that's not how we gather data. Um, we're going to be sampling it at some frequency. So just for the sake of uh, being able to see this clearly, we're looking at a very low frequency here of sampling. Say so we have five time points for each of these actions. Uh, and this graph on the right, you would notice, too, we don't have time as a variable. We're looking at this all in one time segment, and so we're just looking at spatial uh, representation here. There, there's no time component. So we have these points and say we want to, to have the humans do this number of times because we're never going to do the same activity exactly the same twice. I'm going to have some variance in how my hand moves. 
So we want to gather a lot of data to understand how that varies over time and what variance is important. So we have uh, the human doing six examples of hammering, six examples of drawing an X. So we get this data, we say, okay, great. What do I do to distinguish what is act which activity is happening? If I were to throw a new point up there, would I be able to tell which activity it belongs to? Um, this is actually, does anybody have, looking at this, what is the first thing that comes to your mind of how we would approach this data? Are there any ideas? for this task of activity classification. Yes? Check whether, whether um, the points of one color are just, or <coughs> can be separated in the, the different letters. I like that idea. Uh, if we were to somehow look at clusters for the data, like looking, like you're saying, looking at those patterns, can we find distinct areas that correspond to each activity. Um, this is a little messy. There's some overlap here. They're not totally clear clusters, but the idea is if we can kind of segment these off and see which groups of data points belong to a certain activity, that might aid us when we throw <coughs> a new point up there to see what is the cluster that it most likely belongs to, and maybe that can inform us what is the activity that we're doing. In order to train this, we need to do these separately, though. Right? We're not going to train this all on the same data set. So what we're, the real task here is to find the clusters that correspond to hammering and the clusters that correspond to drawing an X. And that uh, requires looking at some of the parameters of each of these clusters. So what we'll do here is approximate each cluster as a Gaussian distribution. And that's a pretty safe assumption because a lot of data that we take from the world is going to be approximately normally distributed. It's pretty reasonable. Um, so the, the parameters for a single cluster, if we have a Gaussian distribution, are just going to be the mean, so the center of that cluster, and then the covariance matrix is kind of the, the shape as it expands outward. But when we have a number of clusters, we also need that third parameter at the top there, the weight. Uh, it's understanding how the clusters, how important one cluster is relative to another. Does one of them encapsulate a lot of the data and one of them only encapsulate a little bit of the data? And so understanding their relative importance. Can you, can you just kind of remind us in this case, what is your state or your feature vector in this case? So is it position? Is it a sequence? You know, do each of those points actually represent a sequence of positions over time? So each of these, attributes? each of these points corresponds to this trajectory. So each point is uh, in the reference, this is showing the reference frame of the human. Right, but, but in the classification, you're not looking at the series, you're looking at, at each pose separately. Uh, we are, no, we'll be looking at um, all, of the, all of the points collectively so, for that time. So can you go, just go back to the slide that you yes. had? Right there, so, so each of those points is, is for example, the blue point is representing particular pose at a bigger point in time, or is it representing actually a trajectory of poses, a sequence of poses? For a single point? For a single point. A single point is the position of the hand at one point in time. Okay, not so, pose. so when you're doing the classification, you're not looking at, at how you move from one pose to the next, you're looking at it as a bag of poses. Correct. Uh, okay. in, in this case, we'll get a little bit more into time segmentation and what that yeah. looks like, because there is a time component of how do we segment What's, what, uh, how much of the trajectory we look at at any given point in time. All right, so we separate the two out to learn each of these models. These are the parameters we want to learn, but of course we want to learn these for all of the clusters. So that's the idea behind Gaussian mixture models. If you're familiar with GMMs, uh, the idea is we really want to know the parameters for each of these clusters in order that we can best describe the data that we see. Um, and so the, we'll look at these, these kind of three vectors that we're interested in, of the weights, and the, the O here just references the object, which in this case is the hand. Uh, so we're looking at the, the mixture weights of each of these, or the mixture coefficients, the means, and the variances for each of the K clusters that we're interested in. So in order to do this, we're really looking at maximizing the likelihood, overall likelihood, of our set of clusters and how they describe our data. Uh, so here we have X being the vector of trajectories that are coming in, so the, the series of uh, each example that we're seeing of the activity being done. Uh, the, of course, then we have the mean that we've already seen. Uh, and so we'll break this likelihood function into kind of three pieces. So first, this, this first component that is big and a little intimidating is it's just the multivariate Gaussian probability density function. So that is um, how, uh, how, really how well that point is describing the, or the, how well that cluster is describing the points around it, how well 
um, how many points are following close to that mean or, or how well is it describing them. Uh, so we want to do the weighted sum of all of these using the weights that we, we mentioned that we're interested in in order to maximize this overall likelihood that the observed trajectories we have, you know, all of the x, uh, are being described by this object, oh, the hand. Uh, so unfortunately there is not uh, a closed form solution to this when we're dealing with multiple clusters. If we're dealing with one cluster, it's a different story, but because we're trying to do this mixture of Gaussians, there's no closed form solution to identifying what each of these parameters is. Um, the technique you'll use to do this is really an iterative hill climbing technique called expectation maximization. If you're familiar with it, it's used in a few different areas. Um, we're not going to go into it here for the sake of time, but uh, what we're passing in here is just these initial trajectories from one activity. So all the points that we, we found from somebody doing the activity six times, passing it into expectation maximization, uh, and we're getting the clusters out of it. It's not guaranteed to converge to a global optimum. It is guaranteed to converge to a local optimum. Uh, so the clusters we get really depend a lot on how you initialize the parameters up front. And so that's important to know in this algorithm. Um, but we're just going to assume at the end we get clusters that reasonably do describe the data. So it's given us our, our weights, our means, our covariances. And with each of these, we now have some likelihood function to use. Any questions so far? Great. So Gaussian mixture models, we said we have one object. We track the object during the activity. In this case, we are hammering. We plot the object's position over time, repeat it for all of the trajectories that we're interested in, and then use the EM algorithm in order to find these clusters. This is what we've covered so far. Now we're really asking the question, how do we use this to classify multiple activities? So we want to be able to find uh, the right cluster for each of the activities that we're interested in. And this leads us to Raptor officially, which is based on this idea of using GMMs to do object-based classification. So I'll quickly walk us through the left half of this, which is training, and then Martina will jump up and explain to us how we use this to test it on real-world data. So we'll walk through this in more detail. It's, uh, it's a lot at the moment, but the input is going to start down here. So the input is all of the labeled uh, training trajectories that we've taken in matrix format. The output is going to be a trained GMM for each object, so the hand and, and the foot, uh, for every activity class weighted by their usefulness. So that's, so the input, matrix of labeled trajectories, right, we will have a, a time component, we're taking the hammering examples, we're taking the drawing X examples uh, as our input. In the output, we want this trained GMM, right, that we just looked at, for every object. So we don't just want it for the hand, we want to understand what the neck is doing, we want to understand what the foot is doing. For each activity class, so we have all of the objects for hammering and then all of the objects for drawing an X, <coughs> weighted by their usefulness. And this we'll get to in a little bit, but we want to know which of these objects is most important in determining this being hammering versus this being drawing an X. Is the foot actually that informative? Probably not, but maybe. We want to know how to weight those appropriately to do activity classification. So we're going to quickly step through what this looks like. So we start by transforming the input matrix to the collection of objects. This is what we saw earlier, right, with the, the human. Each joint is its own object. So next we want to look, we want to have one model for every activity. We're training one model to recognize hammering, one model to recognize drawing an X. Uh, so for example, at the bottom, these are distinct models for every activity that we're interested in classifying. So we're going to follow the hammer thread <coughs> up and see what does it look like to train an activity model for the hammer activity. So we're going to divide the trajectory into time segments, which was referenced earlier. We won't, Martina will talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, but what we want to do is, is train this GMM for every object. So this is what we said. We want to train a GMM for the hand. We want to train a GMM for the neck. Uh, and so that it might look something like this, for example. So we have GMMs for each object for this activity of hammering. And finally, we want to find the object model weights using a random forest classifier. So we want to understand uh, which objects are most informative. So to do that, we're just going to zoom in on that last step for a second of what it is that the random forest classifier is actually doing. So if we're looking at these two activities and we want to say, all right, we, we have two objects that we're considering, which of these is most helpful in me determining which activity is happening? So just from looking at it, it's kind of obvious that the neck isn't super informative and in that this, the clusters here aren't that different from the clusters here. They're, they're pretty similar. 
whereas the right hand at least has a little bit more variation in what clusters we found. And so we would anticipate that uh, we'd really want to weight the right hand more than we would weight the neck when we're classifying this activity. So in order to do that, we're going to use a random forest classifier. Yes. A quick clarifying question about the time segmentation. Yes. Are you saying that for each time segment you have a uh, cluster of of points, or are you saying that all the clusters correspond to one time, time segment? Can you repeat that? You said for all of the one time segment, you have a cluster of points versus? Versus all the clusters, you have like a, a, a set of clusters for mm -hmm. one time segment. A set of clusters for one time segment, yeah. Uh, so here, in the example we're walking through, we're just looking at one time segment. We're not doing any segmentation on our, on our example right now. Uh, so Raptor uses the random forest classifier. And so to do this, um, the, the brief walkthrough of how this happens, we want to fit those object GMMs for the target activity, for hammering. That we've already learned these. We've learned the GMMs for hammering. We want to fit those to every trajectory we have, not just the hammering trajectories, but also the ones we took from drawing at X. So the original data we had, uh, we fit the GMMs that we learned <coughs> to all of the data. So remember, this is the, the right-hand GMMs we learned. Uh, and what we want to do is now calculate the likelihood for each trajectory that it is described by this GMM. So for example, if the first trajectory we had was this five time points that we found, or these five uh, points in space we found, and this corresponded to the hammering activity, this would probably have a pretty high likelihood because they all fall within the clusters we found. Uh, conversely, if the, we take the second trajectory and it happened to come from the activity of drawing an X, this is probably going to have a lower likelihood. Right, the mismatch is happening. So we've got a higher likelihood for one activity, a lower likelihood for the other, for the other trajectory. Uh, and so we say then the last, say uh, we go through all n trajectories that we have, and the very last one is also going to be hammering. So that's a high likelihood. Yes. So this is the the Gaussians are already trained, and the yes. weights aren't changing. Yes. So the Gaussians now are fixed. We found those parameters uh, already, and now we're just looking at how we can weight those. Okay. Yeah, no, that's a great question. That's more of the nuances into the time segmentation piece of it. Um, and that currently, what Raptor uses now is really relying on an expert to identify how to segment those times into uh, discrete trajectories and discrete activities. There are more methods being developed at present that are better at learning what is the kind of on a probabilistic way, can we segment this data by it seems like it's shifting activities. Um, but yeah, that, that right now is just done by, by an expert to figure out those hyperparameters. So what we have at the end of the day are going to be this vector of likelihoods for all of our trajectories for this single GMM. And that's going to serve as the input to our random forest classifier. So each of these rows is one of the trajectories. Uh, and we, uh, each of the inputs is one of the likelihoods from that hand object model. The output is going to be uh, whether or not this specific trajectory, the ground truth, is that it is the activity we were interested in. So remember, the first trajectory we looked at was indeed uh, hammering, and so we, the output is going to be a truth label of one. The second trajectory being the activity of drawing an X, the output's going to be truth label of negative one. So we're fitting the random, cor uh, random forest classifier simply to take these likelihoods uh, and, and accurately predict what the output label is. But of course, we, we don't just want to use the hand. We are interested in looking at all of the different objects we have. Uh, so we have the likelihoods for each trajectory of every object model that we were interested in. So fitting it to the GMM from the neck, fitting it to the GMM from the foot. Uh, and at the end of the day, what we're learning is what weights can we properly assign to each column? What weights can we assign to each object that best enables us to predict these outputs? Does that, does that make sense? So learning the weights for each of these object models. So at the end of the day, this is hopefully what we will have, that indeed the right hand was weighted significantly more uh, than the neck in order to predict what, whether it's the target activity or not. All right, so that's the idea behind how you train Raptor. Uh, Martina is going to come up and show us how it is uh, that we go from training to actually applying this to real data. All right, so uh, Taylor did a really good job explaining how our training pipeline works, and I'm just going to take you a step back and remind you what we've learned so far. Um, so what we've done so far is we've learned Raptor's classifier. Um, so we can go from a set of poses to a task like hammering. 
we know this. Um, and we have these models in our classification pipeline. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to see a new trajectory at test time and determine uh, what the most likely action for that trajectory is. So how do we use this real time, in real time in the real world? And I'll be explaining that. Uh, so let's start with a concrete example of how we would use this. And the example that I'll be using is pouring water into a glass or pouring water into a bowl. So these are the possible actions that I could have. Um, and based on uh, the classification pipeline that we already have, uh, we've already generated these object models. So that's the, uh, the Gaussians that you see there. And then in this case, I've added the trajectories just so that you can see um, kind of the, the motion that I'm doing. So at the top, uh, I assume that kind of at the, the bottom left corner, uh, we see a Gaussian with a very small variance and that would be picking up uh, the jug or whatever we're using to pour the water. Then we have a larger variance on the portion of the trajectory where we're moving over towards the object we'd like to pour into. And then uh, in the pouring water into the glass case, we again see a, an, an object with a very small variance because we need to be precise about where we're actually pouring the water. Whereas in the, in the bowl section, uh, that, final, that final element or that final object has a much larger variance because we can pour into the edge of the bowl or the center of the bowl and we'll still achieve our objective of having water in, in the uh, vessel. Um, and so for now, or I, I showed you those trajectories just to give you some intuition, but the learn model that we actually have is just the Gaussians. So now <coughs> we get a new trajectory and let's say it looks like this, this red trajectory. And what we'd like to be able to do is to compare these to our uh, object models and determine uh, that the pouring into the bowl is the more likely action. So let's talk a little bit more about how that works. Uh, to start, we get a full trajectory as an input. Uh, and the first thing that we do is we split that trajectory into different temporal segments. Uh, and those are, we know that we've learned different objects for different temporal segments previously, so we'll compare to the objects for a specific uh, temporal segment. So that's what we do next. Um, we compute the likelihood of the trajectory um, for the different object models that we have uh, for our trajectory. So on the left, what you see are the two different object models that we learned, and then on the right, uh, I overlay the trajectory, uh, the trajectory on those different object models. And we'd like an analytical way to compare this. Um, and then finally, once we've done that, we return the most likely action. So let's get into some of the math of how this works. Um, the first thing that we want to do is we want to determine how likely a particular uh, temporal segment is in an object model. Uh, and that's what we calculate here. So we calculate the likelihood that this trajectory uh, it can be explained by this particular uh, Gaussian. And then uh, we, we weight those and we sum all of the different objects in a given segment and the likelihood of all of the, the objects in a given segment. And because we're working in log space, um, summing makes sense in this case. And then finally, uh, we do this for all of the different uh, uh, object models that we have uh, in a single time step uh, and sum them. Uh, so just to show you this in pictorial form, uh, we get our full truss trajectory. Uh, we split the trajectory, trajectory into our temporal segments, uh, compute the likelihood of each of the segments, and then finally return the most likely action given uh, each of our different segments. So what I showed you up until now uh, is basically what we'd expect out of a standard activity recognition uh, algorithm. And it's something that we could uh, we could probably do using one of those supervised or unsupervised learning techniques that we talked about before. Um, but the key addition uh, to the literature that Raptor provides is the ability to explain uh, anomalies. Uh, so here, let's consider this case. Uh, may it be, or our model for pouring water into a glass is what you see on the left. So that's what we expect. And now let's say that we get the trajectory on the right. So, I don't know, maybe Mark had a bad day, he's pretty upset. Um, and he does something crazy in the middle of his trajectory. We'd like to be able to say that this could still be pouring water. Um, and then we'd like to be able to explain what parts of the trajectory fit our model and what parts of the trajectory don't. 
But fortunately, we have already considered the likelihood of each of these individual segments. So we have the ability to say that the beginning and the end of the trajectory uh, fit our model, but the middle of the trajectory didn't. Um, and, and because we've already weighted the different <coughs> the importance of the different segments of the trajectory, and we know that the beginning and end portions of the trajectory are more important than the middle portion, we can still say that this is the most probable action given what we've seen. And then finally, uh, Raptor provides a way to return this information in an interpretable way. So it gives some structure. Uh, there's like a basically a, a sample sentence that it inserts different uh, words into. So it can say something like this. In general, uh, the features I was tracking for the beginning and end of the trajectory were very well matched to my model uh, for pour water to a glass. But the features in the middle of the trajectory did not match my model well. And so in this case, uh, we could now learn from this and say, OK, our model is getting confused by what we're doing in the middle of the trajectory. Maybe we need to add more data with more variation in that middle portion of the trajectory so we can correctly classify it uh, in the future. And so I want you to have the pseudocode for this, uh, but don't worry about the algorithm on the left. That's for, your, uh, that's for you to peruse in your own time. We'll just go through the key elements of it uh, on the, sorry, I messed that up. That's on the right, <laughs> um, but I'll, we'll go through the key elements. Um, so the first thing, uh, sorry, the first thing that we do uh, is we calculate the weighted object likelihood scores at every time segment. We compare that uh, to what we expect at each time segment, and then we return the inliers and outliers in that comparison. So now you kind of have a full idea of what the algorithm looks like. Let's talk about how well it does. And the first thing that I want to talk about is the kind of actions uh, or the kind of tasks that it can classify. Uh, so this was tested on three different data sets. Um, the one on the left is one of the basic motion sets, the UT Connect data set that, or it's one of the ones that uh, Kayla talked about earlier. And then we also look at a static assembly test that would be used um, in a manufacturing context and also in a dynamic assembly test. So the difference between that is that the, uh, the person who's completing the task or the robot that's completing the task doesn't move in the static assembly test, but they do in the dynamic assembly task. Uh, so let's talk about how this works. So it, it runs in real time uh, and has stated VR accuracy uh, for a real time system in activity classification. So this is kind of meeting the standard bar you would need to be considered a relevant activity recognition system in the field. But uh, more importantly, it provides explanations for misclassifications, uh, which both lets us understand why uh, a task might have been classified incorrectly and also understand how we might need to change the data set that we're using to train our model to improve performance in the future. But it does have a number of limitations. It assumes that data can be represented by a, speci a specified number of Gaussians. And specifically, we, we have to state how many Gaussians we'd like to learn at the very beginning uh, of our training. And while this is true in the limit of infinite Gaussians, um, that's not realistic in the real world. Uh, so this does give our problem a significant amount of structure. Um, and it also requires that hand-labeled uh, temporal segments, which we've talked about before. Uh, so I'd like to summarize what we've talked about so far. Um, so we talked about the supervised and unsupervised learning approaches, um, which both have uh, much less structure uh, a priori in their model, but are less interpretable. And then we talked about Raptor, which adds additional structure to our model. Uh, but then uh, on the other side gives us interpretability. So this is kind of a, a canonical debate in the learning community uh, in terms of uh, structure uh, versus interpretability. So now that we have this great activity recognition system, I'd like to ask a question. This is the interactive portion of the presentation. Uh, so at this point, how can we help Mark? I'll just take the, oh, sure. You can tell him what he's doing as he's doing it. Right, that, that's accurate. Um, yeah. If he's, like something wrong with him, if he's sick or, or if he's suffering from something, then you might be able to identify what uh, the deviations of actions. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think that that's probably one level above the 
the current state of the art performance and activity recognition, but that's definitely something that we could look into. You might be able to, uh, to get some help in identifying early what's happening outside, so whether a sandstorm is coming up. Right. Those are all really, really good examples. Um, so but so you get the therapy? He looks kind of depressed. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite there. <laughs> If you have an algorithm that can do it, I want it. Uh, but yeah, so kind of going back to our first Well, answer. but I guess the question is, can, can the activity recognition actually kind of recognize motion at some level? Uh, so provided that you had a sufficient data set uh, that explained different emotions, then your activity recognition pipeline uh, could, uh, could hypothetically recognize an emotion. Uh, I haven't seen anything in this particular line of work that does that, but there are other uh, there are other papers out there that do recognize emotions. Um, but yeah, so going back to our first example, um, we can't really do a ton for Mark. Um, we can figure out kind of what he's doing as he uh, does it, but we don't have a key ingredient. We don't have intent. Uh, so we don't understand what Mark is trying to do on a higher level. And that's the information that we need to be able to assist him towards a goal. So I am going to start us off by uh, <coughs> explaining some general approaches to intent recognition. So again, this is kind of going to be a fast, uh, a fast uh, run through a couple of different uh, possible approaches in the field. And then we'll go more specifically into one uh, vision theory of mind. Um, so let's just do one quick reminder, step back, uh, and explain what intent recognition is. Uh, so intent recognition is the, the ability to identify high-level plans from low-level level actions. So we'd like to go from something like the hammering uh, data set that we were able to, or the hammering label for this data set, to something like building a chair. Um, and so in AR, uh, we, again, we want to learn that, that classifier between these uh, actions and our activities and the higher level intent. So the first uh, formulation that I'll talk about is called topic modeling. And in this case, what we're trying to do is we're trying to group different observed actions into sub goals. And so we start with kind of a, a long document and we like to go through some pipeline that uh, gives us the uh, occurrences of different uh, sub goals or topics in our in our document. And so we do this in two steps. Uh, the first thing that we do is we learn different, we learn unlabeled sub goals from unlabeled data. So we take a lot of different examples of drinking water uh, and we see what uh, low level actions, so in this case, having our hand high, having our hand low, having our elbow bent, or having our elbow straight, uh, occur together. Uh, and so that's how we get uh, the topic, uh, topic one and topic two. So then we have these uh, kind of medium level unlabeled actions. And then uh, what we do is we take a new document, so a new uh, large set of actions that we haven't seen before, and we try to understand what lower level actions are occurring in those documents. Uh, so this is really uh, good for uh, using unstructured and, or for unstructured and noisy data, and it's per uh, particularly prevalent in the natural language processing community. It allows for us to have partially ordered plans and it handles actions that may not fit into our model well. Um, so if you do something extraneous, you can basically just ignore that in this method. Uh, and it doesn't require labeled data. Uh, but it does require a lot of data and we need to specify the number of actions uh, or topic models that we'd like to learn a priori, um, which again, uh, assumes that we have some prior knowledge about uh, the data that we're feeding into our uh, into our classification pipeline. And then finally, it can be difficult to interpret because we have these kind of medium level actions, but we have no idea what they mean. Um, and, and that would, or in general, uh, we require some kind of human interpretation of those uh, medium level actions to get anything out of this. <coughs> The next formulation that I'm going to talk about is using, uh, or is formulating this as a constraint satisfaction program. Uh, and the way that we formulate this is asking what goals are feasible given an agent state history. So we'd like to go from something like an observation of Mark being in the kitchen area of the HAB uh, 
uh, and getting a glass to the idea that he wants to drink water. And the way that we do that is we generate a plan library, which is the set of all possible plans given what we've seen so far. Um, so when he's in the kitchen, uh, if we see him, uh, or he has the possibility to get a glass or to get a plate, and both of those have different uh, goals associated with them. One is to drink water and the other is to eat potatoes. But then, if we see him get a glass, uh, we recognize that the, the plate and potato subtree is infeasible, so we can prune it. And then this gives us our, this gives us our goal of uh, drinking water. So there are some considerations for this approach. Um, it's very good in resource, uh, cons uh, in resource constrained and risk intolerant situations. Uh, because it provides completeness guarantees and allows for explicit constraint checking. Uh, but it also does have a number of limitations. It's combinatorially complex in the number of actions that we have, um, and it assumes a level of perfect observability. So we can't necessarily prune a subtree if we're unsure uh, of what action occurred or what, what we observed. So, so far we've looked at some discrete intent recognition uh, models. And the question that I want to ask is, do we have to make discrete decisions about intent? And this leads us to a key insight in the intent recognition field. And the insight that we have is that we can treat the goal, or we can treat the problem of determining agent's goal similarly to the way that we treat the problem of finding a, a path to a goal. So in our traditional planning problem, we want to go from a goal and some observations to a plan. And then in the intent recognition problem, we'd like to go from a plan and observations through an inverse probabilistic framework to determine what our goal is. Can I just ask a quick question, right? So, so, so I understand that the intent recognition is an inversion of planning. But here you said probabilistic programming. Can you explain the use of probabilistic programming in particular? Uh, I apologize. That should be probabilistic planning. Type, I'm sorry. Um, so I'll go into our first formulation of this, which is kind of a warm up. Uh, and we'll use hidden Markov models, um, which most of you should be familiar with, so I'm not going to explain them completely. Um, but our goal here is to say what's the probability that an agent has a specific goal given its state history. Um, so, for example, when we see that Mark's in the kitchen area, the probability <coughs> of him wanting to drink water or eat potatoes is about equal. We don't have additional information. But then once we get our second observation, the fact that he got a glass, uh, we can update our beliefs to believe that he's trying to drink water instead of eat potatoes. And the way that we do this is we formulate this as an HMM where the agent's goal is our hidden state. So here um, in the top row, the agent's goal is the latent state, and then we get observations of him performing actions according to his goal. So, this is your standard HMM formulation. We use Bayes' rule uh, and determine the most like uh, the most probable agent goal given the observations. But we are also keeping track of the probability of each of his other goals along the way. And so, when we do this, um, we are able to reason about agents who complete a task rationally, um, and we allow multiple hypotheses. So we can consider, uh, like when Mark is in the kitchen area, we consider we can consider both that he might be getting water or might be getting potatoes. Um, and it also can include priors. So uh, if it's much more likely that he'll get a glass of water than get potatoes every time he's in the kitchen area, we can include that information as well. Um, and finally, computationally well-known efficient algorithms exist um, for basically everything you would want in this pipeline. Um, but it does have some limitations. It uses the Markov assumption, um, which limits our ability to handle complex interdependencies between actions. So if we have a set of uh, four tasks that need to happen to achieve a goal, uh, that can be hard to work into this framework. Although there are some papers that look at doing that. Um, and I can link those to you, uh, or link you to those if you're interested. Uh, and then we also have no uh, interaction between the observer and the agent. So right now we're just looking at Mark, and he's doing something, and we figured out what he wants, but we haven't been able to assist him. So uh, I'd like to summarize what we've talked about before. Or so far, we've talked about uh, these discrete methods, topic modeling and CSPs, uh, and we talked about our first probabilistic model, which is HMMs. Um, but I'd like to go back to one assumption that we made 
uh, especially in the HMM model. Uh, and in this case, we assume that Mark acts rationally. Um, and to start, this may seem like a good assumption or an assumption that we need. Because if Mark acts irrationally, it's hard for us to determine what, to determine what his goal is. Um, but I will pass it on uh, to explain why that might not be the best assumption and how we can fix that. That was a great introduction, Martina. I think we really uh, need to answer this question, right? Like, should we assume that an agent, when they're in the field doing whatever they are, like Mark, is he acting rationally? So let's take a quick poll of the room. Who thinks Mark will always act rationally? And who thinks he might sometimes act irrationally? OK, yeah, so a lot of people think he might act irrationally sometimes, right? But it's, that's like kind of true. right? He's not going to do like random things, because if he just does random things, then it's really hard to model, right? But he might do incorrect things because he just doesn't understand something about the world. And that's what we're going to get into next, is that this idea of if Mark acts irrationally based on our observations, then what do we do, right? Can you just say a little bit about what you mean by <coughs> irrational? So, so yeah. there's one thing which is, which is acting suboptimally, yeah. right? But are there other ways that they act? Right, so let me clarify that. Um, what I mean by being irrational is, for example, in this, this scenario, right, let's illustrate with an example. Let's say Mark is going to get a glass and going to get some water, right? But we as the observer, we know that the hab's out of water, right? So in our like pruning example, we'd be like, well, no, he can't be drinking water. That's, that's not a thing, right? Because there's no water there. So in, in our observation, we're like, well, Mark is acting very irrationally, right? He's getting a glass to get water, but there's no water in the hab. Like, what's going on? So what, what could be the issue here, right? Why is Mark getting a glass? What do you guys think? Any thoughts? Yeah. So maybe he has no access to that information? Exactly, right? He, he has this understanding that maybe the hab has water, right? And he doesn't really know yet that the hab doesn't have water. So he's getting a glass to go get some water, but the hab is out, right? So this comes back to the idea of belief. Um, we, need to, we need to also model the agent's beliefs in order for us to fully understand the agent as they're going around the world, right? Because in this case, uh, Mark doesn't actually know that the hab is out of water. So he's getting a glass, which seems irrational to us, but it's rational to him. That's what I mean by irrational. Does that kind of answer your question, Professor? Okay, good. Right, so that's when we get into this Bayesian theory of mind, right? And theory of mind being that we want to model everything about the agent, even their own beliefs. Um, and in this section, we're going to kind of Give a brief overview. I'm gonna give a brief overview of how this entirely works, and then my teammates are gonna talk a little bit more about the math and dive a little bit deeper into it. Okay? So, um, let's let's discuss this scenario, right? Let's let's say Mark is wandering around outside on the surface of Mars, and he's looking for some resources. Now he knows that there are three places the resources could be. Let's call them like mines, right? So he knows that there are resources there, but he doesn't know uh, which resource is where. So you know, A could be any of these circles according to him. Okay. So how are we going to uh, model, this model this situation, right? Um, for example, if he started walking towards this circle, the top, top right one right here, right? and he got close to it, saw that it was A, and turned around and walked away, right? we, we can kind of understand that um, during this walk over, he went over and wasn't sure if that was A. And once we saw it and walked away, we can be sure that he doesn't want A anymore. Right? So it's the belief beforehand, before he got to that resource, because he didn't know that the resource is there yet. Right? So that, that's why this is important. Um, so basically, in summary, the, uh, uh, us as the observer, the robot, we're trying to figure out what Mark is currently trying to do, taking into account the fact that he might have incorrect beliefs or not be sure where things are in the world. Okay, so there's kind of two sides to this problem. Right? Um, Mark is actually performing a planning problem. He is trying to figure out how can I achieve uh, getting this resource, his goal or intent, right? uh, the most efficiently. So it's actually a path planning problem, which we've seen a lot of in this class. Right? And on the other side, us as the observer, or the robot that's observing Mark, we have an intent recognition problem. We want to figure out which planning problem Mark is doing, right? And that's where we get into this like inverted uh, probabilistic model that we're going to go into. Um, 
cool. Yeah, so basically, Mark has some knowledge, right? He has his own state, so where he is in the world, he knows exactly where he is, and also the location of where these resources could be, and he can also observe the types of resources that are in these mines as he's walking towards them, right? Um, and meanwhile, we know where all the mines are, and we know what the agent's action is. So as he's walking towards a resource, right, we can tell that he's walking towards that resource. And then here is where, where Bayesian theory of mind is different, right? We, we also have to model his belief. So Mark, his belief is figuring out like which resource is at each mine, right? And we're trying to figure out like what his intention is, right? So we're trying to model exactly what he's trying to do. And then his goal is to figure out, uh, to find a, the best path to a given resource. And we're trying to figure out his resource preferences. So there's two problems. Um, and this, this is the model of the agent's planning problem. So this is Mark going towards the resource. So he has some world, right? He has his own state. He knows where he is in the world. And he knows around him where uh, some resource could be. Right? So that's what he knows. And these two feed into his belief. Right? So if he's walking towards a resource, uh, his world environment state might change. He might see that resource A is over here. And that will change his belief, because now he knows resource A is over there. And then this combined with his intent will feed into his action. right? So if he believes that resource is over there, resource A is over there, and he intends on getting resource A, then he'll, he'll walk over there, right? Whereas if he doesn't want resource A, he probably won't walk over there. So these two things are, will feed into his action, which then go back and change the environment state again, and we get this kind of loop. Now, out of these, this diagram, we really care about is this thing, right? We want to get this intent. That's the important part. So here's how we, as the observer, here's how we get their intent, right? We see the agent's state. So we know where Mark is walking around on, the, on Mars. And we also see his actions. And these together help us formulate what his belief is. Right? So um, formulate basically what, what he's trying to do. And this gives us his intent. Okay, so two different problems again. Um, and once more reiteration, we have this agent's observation of the world, right? So Mark's observing the world, and he takes actions based on uh, his intentions and these observations. And then we, the robot, we're trying to learn the agent's intention based on these actions. Uh, are there any questions on that? Okay, we're gonna. That was a brief overview. But we're gonna dive more deeper into the math now. Huh? Uh, I think that we're introducing a scenario. So I'm gonna, ooh, I'm gonna talk more about the man. Uh, in PalmDP and Bayesian theory of mind, uh, so first I'm going to introduce briefly about PalmDP with an example. So here we are going back to the hub scenario where Mark is at kitchen at time step one, and then at time step two he's getting a glass. For both time steps, we don't know what his goal is and we don't know what his beliefs are. Uh, so the question we're trying to solve is to uh, find out the agent's intention and the most probable belief about the environment. So um, at time step one, when Mark is in the kitchen, we really don't really, we really don't know what he's trying to do. But as soon as we see that he's getting a glass, that we can probably say that he wants to drink water, and he probably think there is water available. So we use base, uh, we use base rule to determine the most probable uh, agent's belief and goal given the observations. So now we're gonna construct the, or rephrase the problem in the PalmDP uh, framework. So we have, the, uh, we have the state space S, which describes the location of each, like, uh, locations on the space. And we have the mines on the, uh, in the world. So the mines can mean anywhere. But in our scenario, for simplicity reason, we will just assume the location of the mine doesn't change. It's not that it doesn't change, it's that Mark knows where they are, but he, is, he doesn't know which resource is located at which mine. Uh, and then it's the action space, which represents what Mark can do, which is move around north, south, east, west, and collect the resource if he sees the resource that he wants, and just ignore, do nothing. Um, so when Mark moves around, there is a chance that he doesn't do that, the actions that he wants to do. So, which is when he is performing a valid action, like north, south, east, west. Uh, but when he's performing an invalid action, uh, in this case, when Mark tries to move to south, 
he runs into a wall. So there, he like fr from this transition, Mark will just now change his state at all. And there's also the special action collect. He will only perform it when he sees the desired resource that he wants, which after he performed that action, that will lead us to a finished state. Uh, so Mark is on Mars. We're, we assume he's in a space suit. That means he has limited field of vision, then, which means he can only see the highlighted grid. Um, so in this case, that means he can only, uh, when he is at that location, he can tell resource C is at that mine, but he still don't know the information about other stuff. Um, and there is a probability of Mars seeing something wrong. Um, so although C is what resource is actually located at that mine, but there is a probability of him missing it. So Mark knows his own location and the location of the mines and the map size, but he doesn't really know like which resource is at what like mine location. So this introduced a specific type of PAMDP called mixed observability MDP. Uh, we use BW to represent the agent's belief uh, that W is the true world state. Uh, in the Martian scenario, uh, Mark, this represents the Mark's belief about which resource is, at lo uh, is located at which mine. So from the agent's perspective, um, <coughs> given an observation and state, the belief update is deterministic uh, for the next time step. But it's going to be different from the observer's perspective, which I will talk about in a few minutes. So to optimize Mark's immediate reward, immediate action, uh, we use reward function. So reward function has two parts. One is a passive reward, uh, which is proportional to the agent's degree of desire. Uh, so the, m the more Mark wants a resource, the more reward points that he gains after getting, gathering the resource. And then there's also a negative reward. So the longer distance he travels, the more energy he consumes. So that will deduct points from the reward function. And uh, based on our uh, definition for the pound dp sour we have so far, that will uh, output a future value function, which is used to compute the agent's policy. Uh, that is the probability distribution over agent's action given his belief and state. So we're almost there finding his policy. So first, the look ahead state action value function is compute to integrate the expected immediate cause of action a with the expected discounted future value by taking that action. So then the agent's policy uh, probability of A given BS, uh, belief and state, is, um, sta uh, is maximized to uh, QLA by using the softmax function. Uh, and the beta parameter uh, is, is established the degree of determinism with which, uh, which agent is execute is policy capturing the intuition that agent tends to, but do not always uh, follow the optimal policy. So um, Mart has figured out uh, what's the best policy, optimal policy that he will take to uh, achieve his goal efficiently. So now how can we use a Bayesian theory of mind to help the observer or the robot to answer a question about Mart's intention? So the answer is actually really simple. We just add an extra layer of, to describe Mark's intention. So in our example, we assume Mark's intention is static. That means he never changed, like he never changed his intention for a simplicity reason. Uh, in the next few slides, we will dive into the formation of uh, Bayesian theory of mind that represents uh, Mark's belief and intention. So once again, the state transition distribution, agent's policy, belief updating function, observation distribution uh, are composed, uh, together com comprise the Bayesian theory of mind observer's predictive model of agent's behavior and mental states. So this representation are composed to form the structured probabilistic model shown here, which takes the form of a dynamic Bayesian network. So the most basic computation of dynamic Bayesian network model supports, uh, supports is forward sampling. So this is a process by which the Bayesian theory of mind observer assume that an agent's trajectory is to be generated. 
which we did with Tom DP. Um, yeah. And in this case, we only know the initial belief and intent. Uh, oh, we, in this case, only the initial belief and intent are unknown to the observer. Uh, so to determine the probability to transit from the previous belief to the next belief, we compute a belief and desire uh, intent transition matrix Z by summing over all action at T minus one and observation at T that could yield the transition. So to ensure only the prior belief, observation and action that produce a belief update enters the summation, we use a delta function. So in order to reason out the agent's belief and intention over time is performed, we use the belief propagation algorithm, a standard approach to inference in DB uh, dynamic vision networks. So for purity, we will describe it um, by analogy to forward and backward algorithm uh, in the hidden Markov model. Uh, so uh, the belief and intention that constitute the agent's mental state is given by the forward distribution. Uh, so this provides a marginal posterior distribution over the agent's belief and intention given all information provided by agent's, project, agent's trajectory up to time t. Um, and this recursive matrix multiplication resembles the filtering function in a um, foreign battery uh, algorithm. So next we will define the backward distribution, which recursively propagates information backwards in time uh, given to give the marginal li likelihood of the agent's next trajectory up to time t, given the mental state at some past time. So together, the forward and backward distribution allows us to compute the joint posterior uh, marginal over the agent's belief and this, uh, intention at time t, uh, given all past time sequence. By, uh, and this is given by the product of the uh, forward and backward distribution, which is also called smoothing. Uh, smoothing. So in conclusion, uh, Bayesian theory of mind, just like our other intern uh, recognition algorithm, that it has pros and cons. Uh, so it provides benefits such as we can now consider noisy observations in the environment, and it also allows interaction between the observer and agent. Um, and it also tracks multiple hy hypotheses, but at the same time, we're still being constrained by the Markov assumption. And generally, the computation, no, the computation for Bayesian theory of mind is infeasible. And we also have to assume that Asian still kind of acts rationally. That means every action that he performs has a motivation behind it or a reason behind it. So Janice will talk about, introduce the piece and talk more about the implementation next. So now, <coughs> so now we'll talk about our implementation of the model. And so our mind model models Mark's mind as he tries to find the resource that he wants based on his intents. And we also want to figure out what his intents are. So again, we have a planning problem and an intent problem. And so again, we'll be res representing intents through a probability distribution over the three possible resources. So now I'll explain our implementation, but more in an intuitive manner since in the PSET, a lot of it will be implementing uh, smaller helper functions, but we want you guys to gain the intuition in order to answer several concept questions on what makes sense when you look at the outputs. And so for the observation part, first we represent, we have three different locations represented by the blue dots. We have three resources. We have six possible belief worlds, and this just means, for instance, A is at location one, B is at location two, C is at location three, and so there's six possibilities, and the agent doesn't know which one is correct. And so our input in, is what Mark is doing, and pretty much we just get his direction of movement. For instance, north, east, south, and west. And the agent can, we can assume that the agent can discover the world if he gets close enough to a particular resource location. So in our model, how we interpreted this, or how we implemented this was, as you can see at um, resource location one, there's a green area around, so we assume that if he reaches within a certain range of the resource location, then he's able to identify what resource this is. However, when we're updating beliefs, we have to consider that he might not actually um, have seen this resource, so we have to consider some noise. So now I'll talk about updating our beliefs, our 
updating Mark's beliefs and what world state is actually true, since there's six possible world states that he doesn't know unless he discovers the world around him. So again, beliefs is Mark's degree of belief in each of the six worlds, and when we're updating beliefs, it's proportional to the previous beliefs, and we're updating um, based on his observation. So when Mark, for instance, goes close enough to one, we can assume that he knows what one is to a certain degree. There's some noise, and so, for instance, if he discovers that resource A is at location one, we are able to proportionally um, edit our previous beliefs, for instance. It makes sense that we should increase the beliefs for the first two worlds because that is consistent, consistent with the actual world state, which is ABC. And next, we also need to represent uh, Mark's state transition distribution. For instance, given some action we wants to, he wants to take, we can't assume that he will actually end up where he wants to be. Again, we need to consider noise. And so how we implemented the state transition distribution, which is pretty much based on your previous state, the action you take, and the world state, what's the probability you'll end up at each of your next states? And so for instance, let's say that Mark is at location 3-0 as in the grid. So he has three possible of actions. He can go right, down, or left. So there's three possible actions. And assuming that he actually wants to go right, let's assign a higher probability that he actually does what he wants to do. So how in our implementation, how we did that was we assigned a probability of 0.9 to the desired state that he should end up in, but we split up the 0.1 among the other states that he could end up in. For instance, 0.9, there's a 0.9 probability that he'll end up at 4, 0, which is just to the right of where he is right now, but also 0.1 divided by 2 among the other two locations. And next we have our reward function. So for again, as Shara mentioned, the reward is based on the intense. He should get a high reward if he really wants this resource, and a low reward if he doesn't care too much about it. And so this reward is proportional to um, this the previous intents, and also there's a negative reward of I think we put negative one and 10. There's a ne cost of negative one if he wants to travel since we're assuming that Mark wants to get to a resource location as quickly as possible to discover what's there. And again, as part of the planning problem, we have our the policy part where we want to be able to model what Mark is trying to do. So this, again, as Charlotte mentioned, is a flow through the value iteration. And it takes into account several of these um, different factors and as long as you understand the intuition of why we need these then it's okay because you won't have you won't have to code this part but you'll have to like understand it so the policy tells us what mark ideally should do based on all his previous actions and the belief state like how like how strongly he believes in the different states the transition and the rewards so again we have to take into account the immediate reward and the discounted future reward because an action might not be valuable right now, but heading towards a resource location might lead to a greater reward later. And so that's how that's why we need the two rewards. Transitions just tell us where he's like where he ends up, the prob probability distribution of where he'll end up, and again beliefs is how strongly he believes in each in each environment. <coughs> and next we're gonna talk about updating intents. So again for this part of the piece that we'll have you run our code, but you won't have to understand it. Just make sure that you understand why the outputs make sense in our scenario. So in our implementation, our intents are based on his action, beliefs, and previous intents. So it makes sense. Based on his action, what resource location do we think he's heading towards? An action can tell us what state he'll end up next, and it tells us how closer or farther we are from the three different resource locations. So that's one information we know. And we also know beliefs. Since Mark doesn't actually know the actual world, even though he knows, he's like heading towards a resource location, but he doesn't know which one. So we have to apply beliefs in order to kind of infer which resource he, we think he's heading towards. And our previous intent tells us about what we believe his value for each of the resources <coughs> is. So the new intent should be based on these factors. And as you examine our outputs for the scenario, just take these three into mind. And as a recap, um, as a recap, Bayesian theory of mind can help an observer figure out what an agent's intents are. And in a situation where there is actually partial observability for both the observer and agent, for instance, 
the agent, Mark, doesn't really know the true state of the world around him, and the observer is trying to figure out what Mark is actually trying to do. So for one, we have to, it takes into account that the observer can only observe what he can observe, and um, he has like a certain degree of knowledge. Both the, observ both the observer and agent have a certain degree of knowledge. Again, we consider noisy observations through our state transition matrix, state transition distribution, for instance, where we assume that he might not end up where he wants to be. And also, um, we assume that if he sees a resource, it's not guaranteed that he actually saw it. So we assign some noise there too. And also allows for interaction between observer and agent in that if the agent can figure out if the observer can figure out what Mark is trying to do, then perhaps he can help Mark achieve his goal and yeah, he can communicate with Mark and help him achieve his goal. And lastly, it considers um, multiple hypotheses because it takes into account his previous actions and it takes into account also the reward, the immediate reward and also the future reward for um, doing this certain action. However, there are just there's a few cons. Uh, before, we have to assume the Markov assumption, where we assume that given the same action, he'll um, behave in a certain way. And also, it can be incomputationally infeasible. For instance, when calculating the policy, we have to look ahead to see um, how the future, the future award ties in, except if we look farther ahead, it takes a lot longer. And lastly, let's look at this overall summary of what we talked about today. And as you can see, we added the Bayesian theory of mind part and the pros and cons we just talked about. And we can see that there are different um, factors that we uh, compared. For instance, the computational feasibility, um, how much observability each model has, and how well they work in different situations. And so today we talked about activity recognition again, which is being able to recognize what actions he's trying to take from noisy sensor data through these two topics. And we also looked at intent recognition, which is trying to figure out what he's trying to do based on his actions. And there has been a lot more um, research. So for instance, what, if you're interested, there has been papers explaining how people are trying to combine activity, in, in activity recognition and intent recognition. recognition. For instance, um, based on given raw sensor data, we can extract perhaps the actions that this person is doing. And then we can use the intent recognition model in order to figure out what he's trying to accomplish. And with these two put together, it can be very useful in many different situations. So if you're interested, you can read these two papers. And lastly, if you have any questions, feel free to ask us. Questions? Okay, so Thank you guys. the point of this, right, is that the robot is going to help out Mark or whoever is doing an action, right? Um, did you guys look into anything where the, the agent can just talk to the robot and tell it what it's going to do? I mean, a lot of this is modeling what you think it's going to do, but it would be a lot easier maybe if the person just said, hey, I'm going to do this. Can you help me out? Did you look into anything involving like speech recognition and stuff like that? So the top of modeling approach uh, can be used in speech recognition. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that that's kind of a common way that you'd go from like a, a document could be the text that then an agent is giving the robot and then the robot would analyze that. I think part of the rationale too behind this is as, as the human, I don't want to have to say every single time I'm doing an yeah. action, hey robot, this is exactly what I'm doing. Because there's the issue of the, the time wasted, the fluency of team communication, or of team collaboration. Um, so that's definitely an approach, and there are there is technology that can at least you know, just handle that and handle the speech recognition and say, okay, great. But I think that that would be a very annoying teammate. Yeah. Okay. Well, what is the key difference between this transfer approach and which is neural net? Essentially, so the I mean, neural nets are notoriously difficult to understand how it arrives at certain weightings between features, the relationships it derives. Um, using the object-based classification approach is trying to make some separation between those, and so you, you know what each node is essentially, like in your neural net. You know what the relationships are within each of 
just looking at one joint at a time um, and just making it more interpretable. So it, it'll perform similar to like a neural net and it's doing the same function, but then just in a way that humans can understand. Okay, Thanks, guys. let's thank the speakers one more time.